Labu dienu visiem klātasošajiem. Hello and welcome, everyone. Es esmu Krista Baumane, domnīcas providus vadītāja, un es vēlos pateikties visiem jums, ka jūs atnācāt uz mūsu gaskārtējo fórumu, ko mēs šogad vēltam migrācijas tēmai. Un mēs šo fórumu rīkojam sadarbībā ar Konrāda Adenauer fondu. Paldies viņiem par to. Paldies arī fonda vadītāja Elzbetē Bauerē, kura diemžāls linijums dēļ nevarēja pati būt klāt. Un mēs pateicamies arī par atbalstu šī pasākuma rīkošanā Eiropas komisijas programmā Eiropa pilsoņiem. Migrācija ir jaunākā tēma providus satura portfelī. Mēs ar to strādājām gan no patvēruma meklētāju un bēgļu integrācijas aspekta, gan arī vēlamies uz to vairāk lūkoties uz migrāciju kā cilvēku un darba spēku kustības skatu punkta. Migrācija ir jūtīga tēma, to jūs visi, kas ir šajā zālē, ļoti labi ziniet. Liela daļa sabiedrības un arī politiķi to uztver kā izaicinājumu, kā draudu, kā kaut ko no kā vajag baidīties. Providus aicina no migrācijas nebaidīties un uztvert to, kā kaut ko dabīgu mūsdienās neizbēgamu, kā arī kā iespēju. Tāpēc mūsu fóruma tēma ir migrācija kā sacensība par talantiem. Providus misija ir, kā te ir rakstīts, ir veicināt uz zināšanām balstītu politiku. Un... Arī šodien mēs runāsim par to, kā ar gudras politikas palīdzību virzīt migrāciju valstī vēlamā virzienā. Mēs uzklausīsim piemērus no Igaunijas un Vācijas un vēl mēs pateikties paldies kolēģiem, mūsu runātājiem, ka piekrit dalīties ar savu pieredzi gan ar veiksmīgu un labu, gan ar neveiksmīgu, ar kļūdām, kas ir tikpat svarīgi. Mēs runāsim arī par migrāciju kā par inovāciju, dzinēju spēku un par to, kā migrācija, kā imigrācija ietekmē dažādu nozaru, dažādu jomu darbu. Un mēs uzklausīsim dažādu nozaru profesionāļu pieredzi tajā skaitā pavāru, tajā skaitā žurnālistu, tajā skaitā mākslinieku, tajā skaitā programmētāju. Un vēlreiz paldies visiem, kas šodien atnāca runāt par šiem svarīgiem jautājumiem. Un es ceru, ka mēs šo sarunu rezultātā mazināsim bailes un vairosim zināšanas, ko likt gudrs politikas pamatā. Paldies, un es tālāk došu vārdu savai kolēģei, providus vecākai migrācijas pētniecē Agnesē Lācei, lai viņa iepazīstina ar šīs dienas programmu, galveno runātāju un arī pasaka aktuālo hashtagu. Agnesi, lūdzu. Paldies, Krista. There are still some seats available. So, I'll switch to English now. Thank you very much for a full house. It's a pleasure to see you all here. As Krista mentioned, today we want to talk more in, uh, about the positive aspects uh, probably of migration and about the policies, how we can foster the full um, potential of these positive aspects of migration. Um, the hashtag, if you want to tweet about our event today, is Gudra uh, Migrati, Smart Migration. Um, and um, so we'll have a keynote uh, from uh, Aya Lula, I'll introduce her in a minute. Then afterwards, we'll have the first panel discussion on successes and failures of policies. Um, afterwards, we'll have a break uh, with coffee, tea, and snacks from uh, Humus Komanda, which is a social enterprise that also employs migrants, uh, among others. And then afterwards, we'll have uh, a, another panel discussion on migration as uh, the driving force for innovation. Um, so now I want to give the floor to Aya Lule, who is a researcher at University of Sussex and also at University of Eastern Finland. Uh, she has worked before also at University of Latvia in the Faculty of Geography and also the um, Diaspora and Migration Research Center. 
Um, today she is visiting from Finland, also a very mobile person herself, uh, but I'll, I'll, I'll allow her to introduce the topic that she'll be talking about herself. The floor is yours. Very good. Good afternoon. So I will also go in English, and it's really strange to speak in English in my own native country. Let's see how it goes later on. Maybe we can switch back to Latvian again. Basically, my main argument today is very simple, uh, and it's a game changer. I want to introduce the idea to talk about migration instead of thinking of migration policies as something that we increasingly more regulate movement of human beings, to think about migration as something that boosts competitiveness. And the argument is rather simple. However, when we go through the various dimensions, we will see that this is a story we have to start to build ourselves. Well, the first dimension is the national dimension, how we think about the competitiveness and, um, and migration. What do we see with the dominant ideas on migration currently in media, in, in policies, in representations? So the dominant ideas in policies are that, uh, that we need increasingly specific uh, policies related to migration, increasingly better defined migrant groups, and when we see the practical implementation of the Latvian um, policy and implementation of legislation, we can see that there are increasingly more sophisticated groups for the single permit and, uh, and for temporary residence, so on and so forth. That's all fine, but this is not a policy. These are specific tasks we have to do to improve, uh, improve uh, competitiveness. So this is from the one hand we see this fragmentation and increasingly specific uh, ideas. On the other hand, we see that the representation of migration is very much hijacked uh, by, the, um, by the politicization uh, of, of migration. And this is everywhere. It's in media, it's in political speeches. Whenever I talk to uh, politicians, either it's in Nordic countries or it's in, in the UK, they say, yes, we understand that actually we have to move away from the idea of migration. We have to talk about something else. But we will not do this because elections are coming and we know that there is no better currency than migration. It's Absolutely so, that migration is highly politicized, highly sensitive issue, and it gets even more uh, sensitive according to the election cycle. In the meantime, in the representation of migration, whether it's when we talk about return migration or refugees, asylum seekers, temporary migrants, and so on and so forth, we see that it's also hijacked with heightened emotional tone. The very stories are personalized. How do you feel here? What do you miss? What do you look forward in your life? And this emotional undertone is also something that is somewhat at odds with uh, competitiveness. How could we uh, de define the competitiveness uh, as a working term, as a working definition? Basically, we, we talk about the basic principles of being better, becoming better, being faster and better than others. But this is just the working definition or one of the starting points where we could start and the very basic one. The things why policy, policies related to migration fail are very much related with the factors I mentioned before with hijacking uh, ideas uh, and politicization of migration. This is why policies fail. But if we go back to this basic argument I started with, that we may think about migration as a competitiveness and as something that boosts competitiveness, we, it's a real game changer and we can change the way how we build the policies. Let's move ahead with this. Um, national dimension. And, and this is uh, perhaps the most, uh, most important and the most sensitive one. 
because uh, usually in, in representation of migration, we think about uh, migration as something um, incompatible with national values. But actually, they are very, very compatible. And actually, we even have to think about the nationalism as something what is vitally based on competitiveness. We think about nationalism in terms of our food, our values, our materiality, our language, our uniqueness, our unique rye bread, our national values, our language, and our nation branding. And now, if we go through all these um, categories and think of these in terms of competitiveness, we can see that they are so much compatible. And this is actually what is driving uh, nationalism nowadays. So this is my next argument, that uh, competitiveness is very compatible with nationalism and with the nation state. Let's, let's take the example of the, of the rye bread, and I will go back to this example. I'm studying Finnish now intensively and doing very well, and I love this language. It's a very difficult one. I hope somebody can speak it here in audience. And in, uh, in speaking courses, uh, we had a discussion about rye bread, and Finland is celebrating its 100 years of anniversary this year. And we had to learn how unique this bread is. And I felt at odds that I do know rye bread also from my childhood, and I know its tastes, and I know the rye bread also from Denmark. And it tastes a bit different, but it's great. It's very regional achievement. But in the national context in Finland, it was packaged very much as something unique and national. This is one part of the story, how we usually think about nationalism in thinking of something unique and only ours. But now I want to tell you the flip side of the rye bread story. Finland also signed an agreement, the trade agreement, with China. And they are selling their rye bread to China and boosting their economy <clears throat> considerably. And this is the part of the competitive nationalism how we think about our materiality and things in the competitive terms. The language teaching, this is also one of the very much the issues we talk about uh, when it comes to migration. The innovations in the ways how we teach the language are really sought for all across the globe because we are mobile and we need new and innovative ways how we do it. And when we discover and implement the ways to teach the language in innovative and effective ways, we can sell these applications and books and know-how also to other countries. So, and so we can go through all these um, categories that we can think of uh, as competitiveness. Moving to the regional dimension, uh, I will be rather brief on this, um, on this very complex issue. But nowadays, um, it is not only that nation states compete to each other, but regions compete to each other, and regions become more competitive through collaboration. And we live in the region called European Union, and we can see that Migration issue is very much politicized everywhere. It's not only in Latvia, and we have to take this into account. We can see that it's consistently going up, um, and especially since so-called uh, refugee crisis in 2015. Migration is by far the most uh, important issue, according to the Eurobarometer. Various, the economic situation and employment is really not seen that important. So we have to take uh, this into account that it is highly politicized, not only here, but also elsewhere. 
but through the regional examples, I will give you two, uh, two different um, examples how to think about the region. And, uh, and one is the, the same example with the rye bread selling to China. We do compete as the, as the region here, we compete with other regions. And another example might be the higher education. If we have the university here, which is really, really good, and we have the airport, and we have all the infrastructure, and the city is beautiful, we really can become the regional hub for the higher education. But we, but we have to collaborate together. It does not work only with the one university itself. It works with the city council, with, uh, with transport planning, with, and with real str strategic emphasis how we are going to grow in the next five, ten years. Similar examples we can see, for instance, not far from here in Tartu, but I can tell that we have a competitive edge compared to Tartu. We do have more privileges in Riga, but we, in terms of transport, in terms of, uh, of the city, but we have to make the strategic decision that we want to compete uh, on the regional basis. And when we make this decision, we must implement this strategy as well. Entrepreneurial dimension is uh, extremely important uh, for nationalism and for, and for boosting migration for the com competitive um, uh, purposes. Uh, let's look at the basic demographic um, ideas. You, I'm sure all of you know these, but um, I want to place uh, our region Europe in, in a bit larger context. What we can see is, uh, and Ilmars may correct me, but the saying is that demography is destiny. And um, through the various forecasts, we need to take demography into account. It does play the vital role for the future planning and for the, for the regional competitiveness. And we can see uh, the, the prognosis made uh, before the so-called refugee crisis, the Germany will lose many millions young people. And the same goes also for Eastern Central region, including also the Baltic states. If Poland is minus 27.2 million change, Romania is even quite close to minus uh, 30%. And in, in Latvia too, the demographic uh, forecasts are grim if, if there are no significant changes in the migration policies and practice. Basically, Scandinavian Nordic region is the only one where we can see the natural growth, even in, in the future forecasts. And this is a very complex issue because we don't think about us only as the European Union. We think about us also as the, as the Nordic countries, and we are included already for at least a decade or more in the Nordic countries. And if we see that the depopulation is so deep in, in the Baltic, whereas the other Nordic countries, the population is growing, these are very serious forecasts that must be taken into account in, in planning um, any step related to migration and competitiveness. And if we think about the Baltic Sea region, which is then one of the largest regions in the world, because if we include Russia, we include Germany. And I have heard in some of the high-level talks that in Germany, to fill this gap, they need to attract at least a million young people. But for our region around the Baltic Sea, hit by depopulation, we need to create at least one million workplaces. So here is quite a paradox for the future competitiveness. 
And now I want to finalize with the individual dimension. And we usually think about uh, migration as the individual gain, especially when we talk about high-skilled migrants and movement of skills. Just the frivolous two photos we usually think of this, uh, on the right side, on the smart, dressed, running ahead others and winning alone. This is how we think in terms especially on high skills. However, uh, this is the first myth I want to dispel. Uh, there is no country in the world uh, that uh, relies only on very selective high-skilled migration. It doesn't work like this in real life because my migration is multi-layered. It could work in a very short term for some specific purposes, but not in a long run. Migration, by definition, is multi-layered. In a totalitarian states, you can really select people for short term for specific jobs, but not in democracies. So we always think about other layers too. Other thing is that we have a really huge diversity of, uh, of migrants and the situation is different for, for a refugee, for a return migrant, for temporary migrant and for family migrant. And they all go through various life situations. For the individual one, the life course tran transitions are very important in terms of education or work. Here is a great university in Riga. I will come and study here. And this is my life transition in education. Or there is a great startup or IT job. I will come and boost my uh, career. But when the family members join or a person finds love and partner in, uh, here in Latvia, the establishing home and having a full life steps in. And it inevitably steps in, in at some point if you decide to stay. So this, uh, this picture on, on, on the right is, uh, is rather ideal idea how we think about high-skilled migration, but the reality is actually very much working, uh, working together. And the last point I wanted to also say about return migration, I have noticed the sentiments in Latvia that we need you back, uh, please come back, we miss you. I think that we may, we may uh, think about Latvia in very different terms through competitiveness. It is an honor and it is competitive to work for Latvia. Salaries in high-skilled professions, in IT, in other sectors, they are not that much lower if you do your job good. In startups, the opportunities are really high in Latvia compared to many other European countries as well. For young people, especially those who have studied abroad, uh, if you go for, for starting jobs immediately after university in the UK or Netherlands or, or the Nordic countries, well, you can, get, you can get a bit higher salary, but you will spend considerably more on your rent. The opportunities in Latvia are big for certain groups. And we should think about jobs in Latvia as competitive. It is not that we need all you back, we miss you. We need to think also of Latvian jobs as competitive. And to finalize uh, these fine points, I want to wrap up with, um, with where I started. That instead of thinking of migration as something where we increasingly have to move, like, uh, to, to regulate the movement of people 
and to put them in certain categories, we actually could think about our strategy and vision of the competitiveness of the state and the competitiveness of the people who already live here. And then this component of migration will be inevitable. And all these dimensions on national, entrepreneurial, regional and individual level, they all are interlinked. Here I want to stop my short talk because I think all the event is rather meant to be a conversation, dialogue and arguments. Thank you. Time for questions. Does anyone have a question for Aya? Okay. Was yeah. In the beginning of your um, presentation, you you made. Uh, if I, I'm not sure if I understood it right. That's why I ask. That nationalism and competitiveness go hand in hand or are compatible. Um, can you explain? I, I did not understand it, I have to be honest. I, I was running through. Okay. I, will give you, I will give you very simple everyday examples. Look at the tables we see almost every day in newspapers, in reports, and you see tables who is winning in education in PISA test. And there are national countries winning in this PISA test. Who is the cleanest country? who has the highest GDP, and so on and so forth. This is everyday competitiveness, which is very much strengthening and which is actually the building block of the nationalism today. And the way how we brand our countries, the cleanest, the friendliest for families, all this branding is very much, it, it, it's, really the building block of the nationalism. Yes. Yes, thank you for this very interesting presentation. I have a question about one specific type of migration which is getting more and more popular now, namely investment migration. Because usually it's not mentioned in academic studies, but it increasingly shapes the profile, migration profile and patterns in Europe in general. Does the investment migration fit into your scheme and into this framework you, you actually described? And is there any specificities about investment migration? So, thank you. Uh, you may be aware, and maybe others also are aware, of, uh, of the single permit uh, schemes in Latvia. And in, in recent years, they have become more and more sophisticated. And there are various types for the investment, uh, investment permit, which is under the single permit. It's a temporary permit. If you invest enough in, uh, in Latvia in real estate, for instance, this is only one type. But there are several other types that are related to investment in, um, especially in businesses, in, in growing, uh, growing businesses of various kinds. At least uh, five, uh, five permits like, that, like, like this are possible in Latvia. This is nothing unique for Latvia. Uh, there are at least uh, 10 countries with existing um, similar single permits in the European Union, in, in uh, Cyprus, in the UK, in, in many countries, uh, you can see uh, similar types. The thing is that this is a single permit and it's a temporary migration, which then can grow into permanent, permanent stay. When it comes to investment into businesses, it is certainly, it's actually one of the pure and neoliberal type of neoliberal type that overlaps with nationalism. This is going to be a quite academic discussion. Uh, but yes, this is a pure type of overlap. 
when it comes to investment in the real estate, that's, uh, that's already um, more on the speculative side because there is no, uh, there is no, this link of the growth is not clear, especially taking the semi-periphery where we are based. But the simple and academic answer is that this is this pure overlap of neoliberal and, uh, and uh, competitive national too. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you very much, Aya. Uh, let's give a round of applause, Aya, for opening the speech. Okay, so we'll go on. Um, the first panel, as you know from the program, is about successes and failures of migration policies. Um, I think Aya sketched out uh, in her wonderful presentation the various dimensions we have to take into account when we think about migration policies. Um, and because on one hand, migration policies is something that shapes migration dynamics, but also migration dynamics are something that happen sometimes despite of policy uh, or absolutely to the country, whatever was expected. Migration policies are also something that should be, um, that are very closely interlinked with other dimensions, such as investment policies, higher education policies, etc. So today we have invited to uh, join um, some experts who have encountered migration policies or some aspects of migration in their lives. And I'll uh, introduce uh, them in the order they're sitting. This is no preferential treatment. <laughs> um, so uh, at the far end there is Mr. Christian Lepig, who is a product manager for Move Guides. Um, it's a tech company that helps people to move. Um, more easily, and he is also an advisor to the Estonian e-residency team, um, helping to create wo world's first borderless society. I'm very intrigued about this. <laughs> um, then we have uh, Agnita Kiopa, who is the Deputy Se Secretary and Director of a Higher Education, Science and Innovation Department at Ministry of Education and Science in Latvia, and uh, she uh, is also uh, she also holds a PhD in public policy, um, which I think is very interesting in analyzing this. Um, Kaspar Berzinc also holds a PhD in public policy, both from the same uh, university, right? <laughs> and um, Kaspar uh, is a public policy expert and has worked as a consultant for uh, both Minister of Education and Science and Minister of Economics, uh, also dealing with migration policies. And Mr. Mr. Florian Schroeder is the CEO of the German Baltic Chamber of Commerce uh, office here in Latvia, but also working in Estonia and Lithuania. Is that correct? Okay. So my first question to all of you, um, and you can divide among yourselves the order in which you answer to this question, is why are migration policies important? Looking from the point uh, of view from whatever... Uh, point of view of whatever you do in your daily lives. <laughs> okay. Um, for, for me, it's uh, very obvious because uh, it, as we talked before, it uh, helps uh, competitiveness, competitiveness, both in quality of the workforce because we can attract like better people to our companies and both in quantity because like in Latvia we don't have enough people and uh, obviously we need to attack them from abroad. And the same goes for education because, oh, I think you will answer it, but let me take it. Uh, the same in, 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 in uh, my opinion goes for education because uh, from one side of course we increase our academic capacity by attractive talents who could work in our universities, and of course, uh, increasing our student body, both in quantity and in quality. Right. Do you insist being next? No, you can be next. 
Okay. Um, yeah. I let me start with uh, flipping the term a little bit around. Uh, in higher education and in science and research, we uh, call migration mobility. Uh, and another thing I would like to put on the table is uh, a distributed, uh, distributed human capital that we hold. We have. Uh, our people all around the world. And uh, we kind of think uh, in terms of that capital of ours as something that we want to be connected and, 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 and uh, work with it. So therefore, uh, when we in higher education, in our policies, when we think about um, migration and people moving around, uh, we think uh, in terms of uh, excellence, of uh, working with the best, and uh, often for the particular job, for the particular thing, uh, you have to look for the talent uh, wherever in the world. Uh, yeah, that probably would be it. Hello, everybody. Um I come from a company Move Guides, which is a global tech company uh, helping companies to move people. So, so my talk will be very practical from the business side, what we see every day, what happens. And previously, our company, which we built before, Teleport, was acquired by these Move Guides. So we help people, like single persons, uh, to find the best city in the world to work and live in. And with that data, advised many city governments in uh, Europe how to attract talent better. So I'm in many ways know like the three sides of the single person, the city, and the company. So why they are important? I think they are not important, they're crucial. So um, looking at the Baltic macroeconomics, I think that the biggest challenge for the next 10 years uh, will be the talent attraction. Um, let me bring an example. Um, our company just last week hired two engineers from India, uh, from our Tallinn office, uh, because it's the sector is booming, it's really hard to hire. So we brought them in. And what one US researcher, Enrico Moretti, has uh, shown is that uh, one, this kind of tech job, creates five service jobs in the economy. So that means that uh, they need apartment, they need uh, somebody taking care of the child when they're working, they need hairdresser, they need coffee, they need food. So, so that's what will be uh, will be increased. So in a way, by bringing those two pe persons in, we created probably 10 jobs in Estonian economy. So that's just two. If, but if it's 100, if it's 1,000, that's where the ne next growth will lay, uh, or uh, the next reason why there wasn't the growth and the country is stagnating. I think so. So in the future, I think Europe will have, uh, next 10 years, 15 years, the growth will be very different. There will be maybe 10 or 15 knowledge hubs, uh, which will attract talent and be a uh, cool place for people who want to build stuff, and the rest of the cities will be pretty boring. I think so. So that's a big challenge. Yeah, thanks. Um, yeah, I didn't want to speak first because uh, I'm, I'm the only migrant here and foreigner, so I thought I, I let you uh, comment first. Um, and now it gives me the opportunity. pointed out. Um, I liked your thing about migration and my mobility. I would add, I would call, I mean, I'm speaking here for the German Baltic Chamber of Commerce, so it means I speak for German and Latvian companies, let's say like this. And in a company, in HR, we call migration maybe heterogeneity uh, in, uh, versus homogeneous um, uh, or, or homogeny, uh, I don't know in English, it's a Latin word anyway. So what it means is that um, actually the, the more different, the more differences you can integrate in a team or in a, con a company or in a country, uh, the better it is because uh, the likeliness that you can solve complex problems increases. And, uh, so, and, and that requires a certain mindset yeah, of a society, of a country, of a city. And that's an open mind and uh, a tolerant attitude. And uh, so I would say that's the first thing a country, a region, a city, a company needs to do. To do. And that's why I think nationalism, actually, I, it's not a term in which I think uh, anymore. And I think it's really, that's an 18th, 19th century term. And it's, it, it just, in the way you constructed it, 
I think it, it, it is of no use anymore because it used to be uh, uh, um, blood or soil, people and language. And that's, um, I think we are past that. We are competing. We are competing in every dimension as individuals, as regions, as companies. And, um, and, and that, um, and there, um, migration plays an important role. You mentioned um, attracting talent. Yeah, that's what everybody tries to do. Um, I would like to add, why don't we try to produce talents, a production of talents? Yeah, because that's the first thing. And you have so many people leaving still Latvia. And uh, yeah, it, I'm not sure if it helps to say Latvia is a great country uh, or, or put some emotions in place. It's, I think, about hard facts. People make decisions based, and this is, I, I, I think, no Latvian wants to leave. He's leaving because uh, of work, pay, or better opportunities, or the perception of better opportunities. So something is wrong with the perception of the future of this, uh, of, of the future of some groups in this country, so that they leave. And that's another, um, I think, screw that needs to be fixed or adjusted. So people, if people think my future will be bright and positive and successful, why should, should I leave? Uh, there's no reason. And uh, we should ask ourselves, uh, why is that not so? Yeah? And I'm not sure it's about migration policy. I think it's about policy in general and uh, the different it's, and, and there plays education policy a, a role, infrastructure, uh, legal things, tax system. Uh, it's much broader. It's, and, it should, and so if we limit this discussion to migration policy, I, I think uh, we will probably run in the wrong uh, uh, direction or wrong road. I, I will leave it. I have more points. but okay. So I know you also have done some research on the pull factors for why do people move to a certain place? How does this uh, link together with what uh, Mr. Schroeder has said? Yes, so we at Teleport have quite interesting data. Um, over the years, over more than 3,000 uh, users globally have used our services. Single persons looking for a better place maybe to live. And uh, to get the results, everybody can use that in teleport.org, it's free. So you put in your criteria, what do you value most in life? Whether it's the big city, small city, whether it's nature, whether it's uh, startups. So, so, and based on that, uh, we give the answers. And for that, we have built a quite unique data system, 300 layers of data on 260 cities in the world. So nobody helps us that much. So we have amazing data scientists working for us. So, so and with that, we, we get a very interesting another round of data. That is, we know in every country uh, what people value the most when going abroad, when looking for a new city. So what do you think is the most important criteria? And globally. Everybody else can answer as well. Yeah, that's important. Something else? Job. Sorry, what? Housing. Yeah. Yeah, so first point I wanted to make, which happened uh, to uh, kind of work out nicely, is that everybody's different. <laughs> you got so many different answers, and that's what our search results show, show that um, there is such a long list of cities that are in top five some, for someone. So it's like looking for a perfect match it's, as a person. It's very hard to find some, somebody who's perfect for everybody. So the cities are the same. So... Um, so that is the first learning of it. And the second learning is that number one is actually um, environmental quality, nature. So that's a bit surprising us in the politics because we are so used to that. But if you live in London and the next forest is three hours away, you get to miss that. I'm not even not talking about Shanghai. So, 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 so that's what is uh, uh, very important that to understand what does the talent want when you want to attract them. Otherwise, you're just making some commercials. It's a great place in some foreign magazine, and that doesn't work, trust me. 
So um, second thing is low cost, like the housing and everything related to that. That's important to people. I would have guessed that that is first, but the pure nature is more. So third one is uh, safety, again mentioned here as well uh, for you. And the uh, fourth one is tolerance. So I would say the first three are super good in Baltics. Uh, tolerance is maybe so-so, uh, but, uh, but, uh, but what I want to say is we have an amazing product here, but we are terrible at selling it. That's the hard and honest truth. And the reason for that is that uh, although we have a lot of conferences where people talk, this is important, uh, but there is a saying in business that uh, put your money where your mouth is. So do we have funding for uh, talent attraction? in Baltics? Not really. Very tiny amounts and uh, Western European uh, cities and countries are doing that much better and they probably will be winning if we continue like that. So we are not getting the point about this great, great product across. Why is that? Do you think? Maybe you can comment on this. Why are we not so active in attracting talent? Uh, well, I think you, we still have to a look at the migration or the policies and actually the migration politics as highly symbolic because it's always a distinction between someone who belong to us and someone who don't belong to our to our society and it's very even even stronger in in Latvia and that's where all all policies currently are still here at the level of like filtering good migrants from bad migrants. And we are not yet in this level of trying to get more of those good migrants. Only after we will kind of step over this level that, okay, we know how to attract those good migrants and we are ready to attract them. Then only comes the next level, okay, we should go for them. We are not till there. And it actually also shows up in, for example, in this, uh, investment visa programs and also, 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 also in student visa programs that the, the recent changes are actually stronger than they were before. So we are still trying to distinct between good migrants and bad migrants. I mean, close all the doors, uh, all the gates, and, and keep everybody... Build the wall. <laughs> right, build the wall. Uh, I don't think so. Uh, I think uh, we just opposite. We are putting uh, out uh, programs and policies for higher education that uh, are meant to open uh, our higher education up. And when I say that, I mean uh, we are putting uh, instruments uh, that uh, should facilitate uh, better language skills in, uh, in faculty. Why? Because you can't speak with anybody and offer anybody anything if you, if you can't say that. Uh, we also put quite substantial amount of money uh, uh, in uh, to provide jobs for incoming faculty. We also put quite a bit of money uh, in postdoctoral research programs, uh, and those programs are open uh, for anybody around the world. Um, and I think once we kind of, you know, go ourselves out and come back and go out and come back, where we create that, 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 that turnaround, I think then we differently also look at uh, how we uh, deal with, uh, with others amongst us <laughs> or being others amongst others. I think uh, Agrit's example quite clearly showed how actually those migration policies are implemented they are implemented through technical fixes that help to support this good migrants idea. And for example, what Agrit talks about is about good migrants and helping good migrants. That those policies will work, but you will not be quite able to say, okay, let's open door to everyone. I think it's very difficult to say good or bad migrant. I mean, then, then we... No, 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 but this is an important point. Because either you are liberal and open or you are not. You cannot be liberal and say, oh, red, I don't like. Uh, or, uh, yeah, and, and that's the challenge. And I'm not, I, I'm not sure, I have my doubts if Latvia is uh, taking this challenge. Honestly, or, or facing it. 
not yet. And I mean, I'm preaching to the choir probably here, yeah, uh, uh, because uh, this is, uh, I don't need to win your hearts here, uh, but uh, we have to be, or, uh, or we have to be very conscious uh, what that means. And, uh, and then we in Germany, we, we uh, know what that means. And I mean, anyway, Europe has been a migrational crisis uh, since centuries. Yeah, let's not forget that. This national thing is a construction, nothing more. Yeah, yeah, uh, and, and I hope you, you understood what I meant with it. Um, of course, we are still nations and so on. Um, I, I, I'm not sure I understood your website correctly. Jobs were not part of the thing, so that means this is a website for people that have jobs and then select, and that are basically maybe what we call digital nomads, and, and they can, or whatever, they're independent of, of, of winning a bread and then search for the best city, because I would insist that if we are talking about migration in, in Latvia, it's about jobs. That's the first thing. I mean, that's the reason I, I just, I made this morning in my office, I asked people, Uh, of all your friends that migrated, why did they go? And they all said because of jobs, or they went abroad to study and they just stayed there uh, for love or for jobs. So, so I think this jobs thing is first. And okay, you have nature, but with only nature and no jobs here, uh, you can attract high high talents. But then where where are they going to work? Uh, this is not. <laughs> this is, uh, I think. Um, Uh, I think is, uh, is, is not really the solution. And nature, um, you have a lot of nature or Landschaft on this planet. Um, I think there you will be in tough competition. And um, so what is needed? Let's talk about this. Um, there's an, I mean, first you have to structure, I think, the problem in the different groups. Yeah? If we talk about academics, it's a different game. And uh, uh, to attract academics or to keep and retain them, it's a different thing. But I, I, this is an academic. Who was in university? Please, hands up. No, no, they're not, some un not honest people. Uh, who was not in university? Okay, good. You, you never studied? Okay, so some people do not understand me, right? But okay. Uh, so we all went to universities. Yeah, so okay, nice. We do now migration policy, uh, and and where are the workers? Where's the laborers? Yeah, they migrated. They are not in this room. And um, so why they migrated? Because they were not offered a perspective. So what does that mean? They were first not offered a training to acquire a profession, a real profession. That is competitive on a global scale because there's no really competitive vocational education training system in Latvia yet. I'm happy we work with the ministry on that one since four years and there has been progress and it's uh, going somewhere and it's great. It's really heartwarming to see but we also have, we have to be honest, uh, we are still some steps before we have a national rollout <laughs> going. Yeah? There's, it's still some islands of success. And there's also some regions or cities of success like Valmira, for example, that has managed in Latvia quite well uh, to keep people and to attract people and to uh, keep them in jobs. And so from these cases we can, we can learn. But this is something that you need to address. And of course you first need to stop people walking away before you think about attracting, uh, uh, that's, that's in the second step. And now, yeah, just a university and a airport, I think, will also probably not do the trick, because there's many airports and many universities. You need, you need yeah, now, now comes the point. Uh, the point is, you need to decide where is your focus going to be. Yeah, so, and you need a strategy, and that means deciding what you do, and that means also to say to 99 things you don't do. Yeah? But there, that needs to be a brave somebody, usually a government, it should be, to make this decision. And if you ask the government of Latvia today, what are the one or two sectors Latvia is going to be 
uh, super in the next five or ten years, you not get an answer. Yeah? Or you get lots of answers, uh, depending which, uh, which person you ask. And, and, and if you, and I'm, I'm, I'm quite sure that Latvia has, is a small country, it has small or limited resources, so you will not be able to be good in everything, so you need to decide and put policies in place and put focus in place, and that's what I think is missing. To sum it up, uh, yeah, uh, need to do something for the skilled labor, and that's also the resource for the investors or for jobs to attract them, because uh, skilled labor, that's the resource Latvia has. Human resources, that's the only, or, or wood, okay. Wood and forest you have and nature, and that will, you will have that, and you, you can sell that, and you will do tourism, uh, but uh, yeah, that's the, I think. Uh, I'm sorry, uh, yeah, uh, your last point begs, uh, begs, begs uh, for me to, to jump in for uh, government uh, not answering what the priorities are. I think uh, in 2013 we defined the uh, uh, specialization strategy for the country, and uh, there are three specialization areas which are, uh, uh, let's say, equally important, but with a different uh, flavor and a different added value structure there. One, rightly mentioned, uh, uh, forestry and everything uh, related to bioeconomy. So that is based on nature. Then uh, medical technologies, the second one, and uh, and the third one, material science, uh, that is related to all kinds of new materials. Um, plus, to those three uh, areas, horizontally, we define that we are working on energy uh, for uh, higher added value in that sector, so to make the economy less energy, energy intensive and also horizontally for ICT to boost up all the other sectors in ICT and also find uh, the niches in ICT. So I wouldn't say so that the, the country hasn't uh, chosen the, the, the uh, specialization. Uh, whether that seems like something uh, very particular, very, uh, uh, very one product, no, it doesn't, but at the same time, we have built the country on the idea of open economy that uh, competes in the world markets and look for the, looks for the niches. If there is an opportunity, we, uh, we, we use it. And so far, uh, if not for the crisis of 2008, I think we've, uh, we've uh, uh, did pretty well. Uh, in that, we are somewhat similar to our neighbors, uh, and our economies are not that much different in, 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 in that respect. And uh, I think uh, there is more work to be put in and, and, and done. Well, I, and I, I just wanted to add that uh, if we just uh, about economics, then actually we are currently going inside the each specific sector. For example, our forestry is different from Finnish forestry then we try to understand how to help Latvian forestry to be competitive. So this job is done right now. But it's, linking back to migration, it's the same. The society, the government, the companies have to learn it, have to learn how to do things. And it's the same in migration. You have to understand that you need migrants, and then you have to understand that how you attract them, how you make them feel comfortable. Uh, and here I just also wanted uh, to answer your short remark about I'm not for like sorting good migrants and bad migrants. No, I, I just was talking how we could proceed in this quite uh, xenophobic uh, environment here. And in, in this environment you just cannot go out and say, okay, let's accept all migrants because they are good. People will not believe you. So you can slowly teach them through education system, to the messages, and the other thing is you can do the targeted policies towards actually symbolic policies, showing that, hey, migrants are good in this, in this way, in this way, in this way. That, that's what I was meaning, yeah. Not just we have to somehow sort them. Uh, thank you, I would like to add to this uh, comment about our website, what we do, and I do agree that the jobs are very important, 
But as you mentioned as well, focus as a business, you have to have a narrow focus, otherwise you will do everything and that's all mediocre. So we were helping people to discover the place where they want to go and help them to move there. So no jobs. So that, that we left that business to others. But I, I do agree that that, that is super crucial. Um, you're not going to a place where it's hard to get a job. Uh, and I think that that brings us to the focus inside the, whether it's the migration policy or how a city or a country is working on this. And I think that sometimes, I see that quite often in Europe as well, like the discussions are in these kind of two generic, ter gen generic terms, like migration policy, this and that. What uh, in practice needs to be to uh, kind of discussed more is that, that in a way uh, to, to make, make the environment good, that uh, stands on three pillars. First is the talent attraction, then is the business attraction, and third is the capital or investment attraction. And those are three very different fields. You, in each field, need to understand what are we doing badly in the talent attraction right now? What are the bottlenecks? And then offer the activities to solve them. And it's very different for uh, business attraction. Even the people need to be different who work there. Their competence level needs to be different. And the third one is the investment attraction. So, so in a way, sometimes things are being done without understanding where this belongs or what this fixes. So I think this kind of systematic approach and research in every field, uh, what needs to be done, this is super crucial. Thanks for the answer for the three uh, uh, focus areas of the government. Let me ask you back, uh, how many new employment places were created in these three sectors? How many were planned to be created? And what's the 10-year vision of, of that? And how many were in the last three years created? Oh, great question. Right, right with the hammer to the head, um, uh, which, is, uh, which is well deserved. Uh, uh, I can only answer for the higher education and research, uh, given I, uh, that's my field and that's where I, I know the statistics. Uh, and uh, again, I will not tell you uh, exact numbers, but to, to, to my memory, uh, in the research field, we planned, um, just give me a second, to get, together it was uh, uh, shared between uh, the three uh, with all five fields, there are three plus two, uh, two horizontal. We plan to raise our uh, research employment from uh, 5,700 to uh, 7,000. Uh, 7, uh, that's our plan. Uh, we are not moving uh, at the pace that we intended. Uh, because we have not uh, been able to secure the political commitment uh, to investing uh, into those fields. Nevertheless, we uh, work towards it. We uh, put our programs that uh, should support, uh, and why I'm saying should, because they have incentives uh, worked in those programs uh, that should uh, bring in uh, private, uh, private uh, uh, players and, 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 uh, and it all goes into those five, uh, five fields. Yeah, well, thank you. Uh, I mean, my short analysis would be in the forestry. I don't see this is a, I mean, this is a good sector for Latvia, but I don't see there thousands of workplaces to be created. More likely, it will be there will be technological innovation, and and people will there will be actually less people working there. In the medical uh, sector in Latvia, now I, my job in this game would be to attract the German investor in the medical uh, field. Yeah, well, they come here and ask the people on the street, "How's your medical? How's your health system?" And they will tell you, "Yeah, that, that's that's the reality," uh, because I we accompany investors and people yeah? and they come and talk and see a health system that is working for uh, two percent of the population or five percent and 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 look look if you want to be excellent in something as a country you have to be excellent in the medical field you're not going to produce a medical technological industry without a home market without hospitals without the whole thing. I mean, Estonia is then much better because everything digital. And me, as an investor, I would go to Estonia because there I can, uh, I can, uh, yeah, kind of test bet for the uh, 21st century health system. Yeah, and um, and so I, I, I think the strategy will not work. 
Yeah. Uh, and okay, material science. I don't know what is this. I mean, I, I know this term, but I haven't seen much uh, uh, but that that was making a wow on 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 me. Uh, in, uh, 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 no, I don't say nothing is working. But is it a matter? No, no, yeah, no. Is it a matter? Well, I'll open the well, floor to questions yeah. now. But is it a matter of like uh, these failures that you mentioned? Is it a matter of there not being enough people uh, that we haven't been able to attract talent, or there is no talent, or is it a matter of other services which are beyond the scope of the conversation right now? I think what I want to make, what the point I'm making is, if you are a government and want to have a strategy, it has, uh, there has to be, uh, it has to be smart in a way, and and leading into the future. Because uh, what we discussed is, we want to make people stay here for the strategy. So you have to make them believe that in five years they're going to work there, and and so it must be something with the future. And then if you do it, then you need really to take everybody on board, the city, uh, the stakeholders, yeah, to find to make a cluster, to have an enabling environment, and 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 then you have to do your homework. And so what I right now see, I mean, we can talk about what is uh, what is good in Latvia and what is working. The success cases, no no problem. Uh, but uh, the migration uh, issue is certainly not a success case for Latvia, and that's why we are uh, talking a bit about problems today. And I think it's 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 part of it that you openly discuss it, and that's that's also that that's part of this open and, and liberal uh, climate. And it's not helping to say everything is fine. Uh, yes, but but you you see, I, I do agree that uh, if we had like much better strategy for economic development and developing environment and it would be easier to attract migrants and also to keep more local population here. But even in this situation, we are talking about sectors who are in huge lack of quality workforce. So this is still important for Latvia to ease the migration policy and to try to attract them. Even in the situation where we are, we can still focus on on trying to make an interest in, 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 in those qualified people to live here. And I think this is our job to do that. Uh, just to add to this uh, uh, good and bad migrants discussion, and I think that's, that's very hard to do sometimes to, to differentiate them, but, but it's possible. Like you mentioned, the policy exceptions, whether it's the startup visa or, or, or different kind of if you have a job, then you're, uh, which is probably like in Estonia, we have a policy that if your, your salary is two times higher than the average, you get the visa with like faster, uh, faster system. So, so these kind of things can be done. And but I, but I think that what is really needed also publicly is the discussion that uh, with this uh, alt right and uh, nationalistic tendencies popping up, all the parties are very afraid to take the stance that yeah, people outside are welcome. But, and if you don't have those brave politicians, nothing will happen. Because if you don't have the government will to do it, you won't have funding, and then you will be just doing tiny things and nothing will change. So I think that's what needed. And I see it, that a bit happening in Estonia, although with like, like not that actively as I, as I would like to see. But what it needs is like a great leader, or storyteller, a great politician who explains how those people coming here, who are smart people and culturally similar to us maybe, can, uh, can provide so much value in terms of what money they bring and also the expertise uh, that, that this, I think, can be sold. It's a long process. It's a cultural change. Um, our data also shows that the tolerance visually, uh, looking at the map in Eastern Europe, is much lower than in Western. And I think that politics are a bit better uh, than the Euro Eastern European average, but that's a like, low baseline. So, <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, so, so I think that's a huge challenge. If you don't have that, then the immigration policy stands like on a weak ground. Uh, yes, but also don't put everything onto politicians' hand because they have huge pressure. As you told yourself, those uh, xenophobic tendencies are very, very hard. So it's, and there are like political groups who are like really benefiting from them, who are scaring people. Yes, yes, yes. And if you are even a good politician, it could be a suicide just to go outside and say, hey, we open door to migrants. So we need actually a help from the industry, 
from the higher education sector, from the non-governmental of explaining why you need those specific people and helping to create this, not very general that all oh, migrants are good, the, the discourse, but very specific discourse. We need this kind of people, please bring them here. And, and, and this helps the politicians because then you have one that's scaring side who are trying to get some votes from scaring people and then this like pro-migration politician then he can go outside and say, hey, they're like a huge group of companies and, 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 and education institutions who need those people. Please, let's help them bring in and everyone will benefit from it. We need those stories. Okay, uh, let me take a step back and look uh, Europe from above and uh, from a distance and uh, one slide showed the problems that lay ahead in 2030, 2050. So we have a lack without France is producing, reproducing itself very nicely, but uh, countries like mine, Germany and others have a problem, we are not making enough children. Yeah. So, <laughs> to put it mildly, now, yeah, <laughs> I did too, <laughs> okay, whatever. So, uh, now, uh, if we come to the vision that, uh, for example, Latvia could uh, be um, leader in producing talents, because I think you have talented people. Yeah? Uh, and uh, no, 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 please, no, 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 no. But it means to have a system which is really producing. I mean, that's the, that's the aim of every education system, I think. Yeah, but. Uh, um, I'm, I'm not sure if Latvia is already there on the PISA one, and I'm also not sure if PISA is the right, uh, actually measuring uh, the right indicators. That's another discussion. Um, uh, but uh, definitely, there I would I would in, envision that uh, Latvia would be a country where there is a vocational training that is uh, the best in the world, and that means to giving. Uh, People, young people that come from that finish the schools with 16 years, uh, get into a company slash training system, receive a salary, although it's low in the first year, but they receive a salary. They don't have reason to look to go somewhere, and, and that then leads them up into a career, and that is well possible to do here, and it doesn't take rocket science. And now, now, now comes the twist. Um, now, we, we know that there will be people from, let's say now, I don't know about the political situation in the future, but let's say there are people from Ukraine and Belarus that would like, or even Russia, that would like to migrate to Europe. Yeah? And there are many. And uh, so, um, why, could, uh, why could it not, why could Latvia or, or the, these countries, because it's natural, people would go through these countries. Why could that not be... A, a place where you you produce human resources, yeah. And instead of oil, you produce human resources. And uh, I, I don't mean babies, but I mean, uh, yeah. Uh, don't get me wrong. It's just a thought uh, idea, and I'm I have not uh, thought it, given it much thought if it could work. But Europe will need migration, and um, if if Europe uh, could choose between North Africa and uh, and other countries that are in the vicinity, probably, uh, yeah, we would, uh, that, that makes more sense. Yeah. Well, actually, there are quite uh, many Russians moving now to Latvia because of politi political conditions, especially like the professional class who exactly want to raise their children in the democratic country. And uh, I also agree that this is one of the, like, the best and maybe the only strategies for Latvia is to get the education on the top level, in all levels, starting from the little children and then with higher education and then with all the vocational and professional education. That's pretty much our only option. But I was wondering why people didn't say that education is important because usually when people choose the location when they want to leave, they also look for like what their children will get the school qualities, but what is surprising for talent, the university quality isn't. So because they are finished and it's not that, so, so that's, that's 
that's valuable for the society, but not a good selling point. So, so in a way, you need to uh, you need to kind of understand that. So, but quality of schools and English-speaking school is super crucial. That's also like in domestic migration that people move to places where there are good schools and good services for children and families. So it's pretty much the same, and 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 we can work with that. It's, it's good. Okay, so we'll open the floor uh, for questions. We'll get three questions, very short questions. <laughs> uh, three questions at the same time. We only have one Hi, I, I will just respond, basically. Uh, listening to you, I got even more convinced how important this national dimension is because you were so contradictory to yourself. You were attacking the government here and there and pledging to the state and how liberal or illiberal we are, as long as we ex exclude the state from this discussion. And this is a really wonderful refuge to live in the ideas of transnationalism and globalization and global citizen. I've been there, I love it, I'm writing about this. As soon as you exclude the nation state, the state, out of this discussion, you leave the bubbles, the globalization bubble, you leave the so-called local bubble, and then you leave the liberal us. And we are all us against them, but the policies are still made at the national level. We need all these four dimensions. I got even, even more convinced on this. As long as we bring the state back into this post-national thinking, we can move ahead, especially for the small states like Latvia. Germany, with the globalization powers, will survive. Latvia will not survive as long as we take the state dimension out of the discussions of migration future. Thank you. Oh, yeah, sorry. Hi, um, so we've been talking a lot about like different types of migration, good migration, bad migration, obviously. Oh, sorry. Um, I'm in a class, I study at the European Union, when I study migrati uh London uh English, okay, sorry. Um so I just was wondering, um, in terms of good and bad migration, you're talking about we need to switch the 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 perspective of Latvians to look at migration more positively. Um how do you think that the whole um asylum crisis, the refugee crisis influences this? Because a lot of people in Latvia say, Oh, it's the refugees leave once they get here anyway. Do you think that affects this conversation? And should the government be a leading role in this if you're going to change, I don't know, society's perspective? From uh, one side, okay, there were refugees, as in all Europe. Uh, maybe it's not that they like stay here. But from other side, you know, it's like, somehow hurts uh, national self-confidence that, oh, even refugees left our country. You know, this is very mixed, I think. I, I just like to respond sure. uh, as well. Uh, well, first of all, I didn't attack anybody, and I think it's bad if, if there is a notion that I attacked anybody, and please, not the government. I asked questions, and I, I, I did that, and maybe they were provocative, but please don't feel attacked. Uh, uh, really, that's not my attention. And I'm uh, advocating and, and speaking actually as a big uh, um, patriot of Latvia, uh, if you want to so, because uh, the question I pose to myself is how can the situation be done better and not worse? And in order to do it better, you have to sometimes be brave and analyze and, and uh, look in yeah, the, the problems. I think to the second question is state and nation. I think there's a bit of a mix uh, uh, of, of things. Uh, I do not think that government or st the state should be left out, and not at all. It is one of the important actors, and I, 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 um, I refer to it many times. Uh, nationalism is something I meant, and this is something uh, 19th century, 20th century, and uh, me as a German, we have done nationalism until, yeah, okay, uh, and, and, yeah, uh, so uh, thanks for interrupting. Uh, and, and, and so the nation uh, is, is uh, I'm, I'm also not sure if it's really a question of survival of Latvia. Uh, uh, I mean, that would be very sad 
if 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 that is your fear fear that Latvia will survive or not survive in the future. Uh, I think uh, in the European concept uh, there is it's it's well thought through, and uh, so far we managed to integrate and to have an an I uh, or an even uh, let's say um, how do you say uh, um, yeah. Uh, a level playing field for for the also the smaller uh, states or nations if you want to call them like this and so um, I don't share your fear in in that and Europe is the answer for for that globalization and um, yeah um, if I may comment on the refugee question real quick I think um, accepting refugees in the relocation program actually highlighted some of the issues that we have with employing and integrating immigrants in general. It was like a litmus test for our immigration and integration policy, basically. So, for example, language regulation, education access, etc., etc. So you can think about it in that, those terms and then look at how that highlighted all the migration policy discourse in general. It also heightened the tension of society towards immigrants because we have a lot more immigrants in the country but we don't know about them. We know about the 250 refugees that are here. We don't know about the 90,000 other people with foreign passports. It was like a, a good signal that these problems with uh, like refugees, they were resolved in, like a, in a decent way. It wasn't just said, oh, okay, you don't like it, you leave. There was really an acknowledgement that we have to work with that. Is there, uh, and that's a question, is there a campaign or a public awareness uh, um, activity going on uh, at the moment? Like, I mean, I remember, I, I'm not because so I'm really not aware of it. Please inform me. And uh, I mean, the notion, it's easy. Yeah? Everybody's a migrant. Uh, uh, that's uh, one of these slogans. Uh, uh, it depends on where. Yeah? Uh, or, but it's also true in, in the, if you ask in Germany, in my family, we, the, the half came from Poland. Yeah? I mean, half Germany uh, migrated at some point. Uh, it's just a matter how, how far you go back. And... Uh, Probably for Riga, it's tr it's true uh, as well. Yeah, I mean, there you have a lot of migrants here, and to to get that back into the consciousness uh, is uh, maybe people need to be reminded of that. Mm. Okay. Any more questions? Okay. Okay. Thank you. Uh, my name is Jack, and I am an entrepreneur in the um, service industry. Here in Riga, I'm born in Denmark um, and migrated to Latvia, mostly because of the freedom that you find here and because of my wife. Anyway, uh, two, two things that I would like to bring up. Uh, the first thing uh, over here, where you, you're, you're talking about importing or talent migration. And you're then saying, for every high talent, I interpret it as being well-educated, high-paid job, we create five other jobs. But here comes the problem, because I'm in the industry that is supposed to service you guys, but I can't find people to serve you, because they're either they're gone, or I'm not allowed to use them, say, um, uh, refugees, I can't employ them because of language rules, I can't take people in from Ukraine, Belarus, language rules, so I'm having an issue with you bringing people in, because I can't service them, however much I would like to, so that's a bit of an issue. So I would very much like to see the panel here uh, bringing in this layered migration because all layers need to be served. Otherwise, the whole things fall apart. You see, it gets top heavy. So it, it will tip over. That's one thing. Second thing over here. Well, thank you for bringing in the, the, the whole thing around growing talents. Now, I have three children myself if we are going to have a competition about this. Um, and my oldest, 12 years old, he asked me not so long time ago, so that I want to have an engineering degree in liquid mechanics. It's kind of, <laughs> Can I do that in Latvia? Uh, I actually don't know. So I sat down and tried to figure it out. And I ended up with a list of universities in Denmark and Germany where he could study this very special field because I couldn't find anything around here. Meaning, he might actually leave the country for education. An issue. Uh, 
Um, I think the layered approach makes sense. Uh, but on the other hand, what I think is important is um, that uh, those, those people who come from abroad with, for higher salaries, they sometimes can, can pay extra as well. So, so I think that in Estonia also we have the same problem that the, with the raising salaries, it's harder, uh, maybe sometimes uh, uh, people like ask more than you can pay them in service industries. But what I think that needs to happen is the, the outgoing price needs to change higher. So you need to charge your customers more with that. If they come from abroad, they are willing to pay that probably. And with that, you can pay higher salaries. Because I think we have the for workforce, but just sometimes the salaries are too low. <laughs> well, and then, you know, answering about liquid dynamics, uh, we are a small country. We cannot make everything. And, and, and therefore, it's important this uh, migration becomes also for us. Because, for example, your son will go to Denmark, but our industry, for example, works with thin films, which is also a very specific field in physics. And we will get someone from Denmark coming here and studying thin films here if we get a very good program. So that's how I see it should be. So. Uh, I think language is a, is a really one signaling thing. And uh, there I, I learned there is a language commission something here. And, and there... And, and they are translating names or checking if, it, come on guys, this is really, really, I mean, I, I was recently on a panel discussion and I saw my name, I couldn't recognize it. And uh, look, I, I find it disrespectful, yeah? My name is my name. Why you translate my name? Sorry, it's a name. It's a name is a unique thing. It cannot be translated, yeah? It's not content of a language. And I find it, I find it highly disrespectful. Now I am provocative, yeah. But uh, 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 okay, China, even in China. No, in 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 China, in China, in China. Okay, you have a different. In China. Yeah, okay, I know Latvians are suffering because I learned the the, the story about uh, the, the the foreigner had a baby and then how it's going to be named and and, and so on, uh, or even it's Latvian Russian and and so on. I think we can talk about discussions okay. in the language uh, regarding if hiring. You have, if you have the same same alphabet, no reason to translate the name, uh, and even if the people then pronounce it wrong, if you have a different alphabet. Uh, you got it. Uh, but, 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 you know, I, 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 but, you know, you know, this is not just Latvian problem. I have, I have an example in my family. My sister married a Spanish man, and they have a kid whose name is Daniel. Daniel's in Latin. And he was Daniel in Spain, and he was Daniel in Netherlands, uh, in, in Brussels, where he was born. And it's even worse with the last name, because he was Berzinch in Latvian, he's Berzinja Peña in Spain, and I even forgot how he was made in Netherlands passport, because they said that, oh, we are not accepting two surnames. Okay, it's Spanish rule, but we are not accepting it. So, sorry. Those things happen in Europe, not just in Latvia. Perhaps these things should be on the list of what people evaluate when they move to a place, right? <laughs> so, will I like my name in this country? <laughs> but I think it's very much relevant regarding whenever you employ foreigners. What is the language level expected uh, in the service industry, for example, for foreigners? Uh, that must be uh, challenging. Um, any more questions from the audience? Hi, I can't help but ask uh, Christian the question, where is food on the list? Um, we, we don't uh, have the direct food uh, layer yet. We're working on it. Restaurants, it's hard to find sometimes, like to measure them. But, <laughs> so, yes, I think that's, it, it's quite high. Uh, so, so, so that is something that... Uh, is a part of the environment, and, and I think the part of the environment is also the, 
the the culture and the language and i think that like if it's 1985 right now let's have it all in latvian it's closed country nothing kind of is open uh, but it's not anymore so i think that we need to kind of think out of the box and forget some language barriers and and i think that coming more and more employees come here who who are not supposed to speak latvian or estonian they're just foreigners who help us so 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 in many ways these things that stop your business those must be changed this is part of the policy setup I'd like to thank uh, the panelists and uh, give them a round of applause. Um.